Welcome back. In the last segment, we considered where to launch satellites into orbit. And we noted that once a satellite reaches orbit, the rocket engine turns off, or more likely completely runs out of fuel, and the satellite is in free fall, passively moving around the Earth. However, if a satellite wants to change orbits or make some kind of course correction, it's re it requires an onboard rocket or some means to propel itself. We know that liquid or solid chemical rockets are our only option when launching from Earth. And that's because only chemical rockets can provide the sustained amount of force needed to get off the ground. But there are other options once we're actually in orbit. And in this segment, I want to consider three of these alternatives to chemical rockets. The alternatives that we'll cover are electric propulsion, or ion rockets, nuclear propulsion, or nuclear thermal rockets, and solar sails, which are as cool as they sound. These three options can't be used for launch, either because they're too weak to lift a spacecraft off the ground, or in the case of nuclear power, too dangerous to consider. I admit at the moment many satellites still use onboard chemical rockets even once they're out in space, but that's changing, so it's worth to consider the alternatives. Good, so let's first talk about electric propulsion. Electric propulsion, also called ion rockets, comes in a variety of forms, but the idea is the same. Electric propulsion uses electricity, the electricity generated by a satellite's solar panel, to ionize a gas. The resulting ions are accelerated to a high velocity and shot out a rocket to push the satellite in some directions. So first you might ask, what's an ion? Okay, so let's say you have an atom, an atom of like oxygen or nitrogen. Atoms are a bunch of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Usually the electric charge of the protons and electrons cancel each other out and the atom is neutral. However, if you strip off an electron, the atom is now electrically charged and is called an ion. If this electrically charged ion is in an electric field, it can be accelerated to super high speeds. So the idea of electric propulsion is to ionize a bunch of atoms, accelerate the resulting ions in electric field, and then send them out the back of your rocket. Going back to Newton's laws of motion, force equals mass times acceleration, this means to maximize the force we want a fairly massive atom that can be easily ionized and accelerated. So gases that are currently used for electric propulsion include xenon and krypton, and that's krypton, not kryptonite. Once an atom is ionized and accelerated, it's possible to get exhaust velocities up to 100 kilometers a second. Like, OMG, right? This is so much larger than our puny chemical rockets that have exhaust velocities of two or four kilometers a second. 100 kilometers per second exhaust velocity is crazy, but there's a catch. Like, there's always a catch, right? The amount of mass an ion rocket can accelerate is tiny. And so going back to the rocket equation, the initial to final mass for an ion rocket is nearly the same. That means the ratio of initial to final mass is close to 1, and the natural logarithm of 1 is 0. In other words, despite the amazing exhaust velocity value, the final delta V of an ion rocket is actually pretty small. It's so small that ion rockets can't be used to launch from Earth. They, they just don't have enough oomph. But once we're in space, ion rockets are currently in regular, regular use um, for small course corrections or to change and maintain orbits. The second alternative to chemical rockets are nuclear thermal rockets. These have been in the news recently, so let me explain how they work and then comment on their use. In a nuclear thermal rocket, nuclear energy replaces the chemical energy of, combu of combusting fuel and oxidizer. The nuclear energy comes, for example, from the fission of a uranium atom. When uranium is bombarded, it can split, creating a lot of energy. That's splitting the atom. But for nuclear-powered rockets, you still need a way to create exhaust. So these rockets still have a fuel source, like liquid hydrogen, which is superheated by the nuclear reactions. Similar to chemical rockets, the actual propulsion comes from sending a superheated gas quickly out the back of a rocket. The exhaust velocities possible with nuclear thermal rockets are slightly larger than chemical rockets, roughly three to five times larger. And if we think back to the rocket equation, that's pretty big, that directly translates into larger delta Vs, larger velocities. Larger velocities means shorter travel times, reducing, say, a seven-month trip out to Mars down to a few, few weeks. 
Shorter travel times, especially on a crewed mission, means lower all overall risk. So nuclear thermal engines are being considered for deep space. But given the unthinkable safety risk, these should never be considered near the Earth's environment. The final alternative to chemical rockets is super cool if you're planning a trip into deep space and don't mind long travel times, like hundreds or thousands of years to reach a destination. These are solar sails, and the idea is to use light itself to push a satellite or spacecraft using the, a large reflective sheet. It's the same principle as a sail catching the wind. And now this might sound strange. If you're standing outside on a sunny day, it's not like you feel the light from the sun pushing on you. And it's true, photons, light, do not have mass, and so they can't push in the same way that a wind, the wind pushes a sailboat. But photons do have momentum, and when a photon bounces off a surface, the change in momentum acts as a push. Solar sails capture this momentum with sheets of large reflective material. The push is super, super tiny, but over long periods of time, think like decades or centuries, it can add up. Solar sails have been tested in space a few times and shown to work, although this alternative is really not practical for Earth orbiting satellites. What's cool about solar sails is you don't need any propellant. You're using light to create acceleration, but at the cost of having to be very, very, very patient if you actually want to get anywhere. So coming back to reality, all satellites launching from Earth use chemical rockets. Once in orbit, satellites need a small onboard rocket in order to change orbit or make a course correction. Most satellites still use chemical rockets for this purpose, but an increasing number are adopting electric propulsion systems. Maybe in the future, thermal nuclear rockets will be used well beyond the Earth's orbital environment, and solar sails is a cool idea if you're interested in a very long, slow voyage. So that brings us to the end of the module. Over the last few segments, we've explored how rockets work. In the next module, we'll turn our attention to what rockets are carrying, focusing on satellite payloads, the instruments and components on a satellite that make them work. So see you over there.